All right, Pano, what's up, man? Hey. How are you? I've been doing well. How about you? I'm good. It's weird starting the, these things. You start recording, you've just been talking, and then you record. Yeah. Yo, hey, you know, it's, it's just. Well, it's not live. So if yeah. people are watching this, then yeah. we know it turned out well. <laughs> something yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, you know, yeah. it, it's something changes too when you record. And I try to, I was in a conversation with someone. I'm like, I want to have a private conversation but I, I want to, we're, we're going to record it and I want to yeah. tell you, but I don't want it to be private. Like we're not going to share it. And it still, I think brings a different quality to the conversation, you know, um, for who knows what reasons, various reasons. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, man, I, I, I'm glad you popped on with me. And I, um, mm -hmm. the reason I reached out because we were talking before started looking at the, uh, the sermon on the Mount and just that first chapter, the first, maybe, you know, or chapter five to seven of, of Matthew, Matthew's gospel and Luke's, of course, but uh, specifically Matthew's and, and looking at the Sermon on the Mount and I've been, some things have been popping up in the different channels that we watch and that that's, there's not a lot of uh, treatment on the sermon. It's confusing and it's, you know, so I'm like, oh, I've never really looked at it and talking. Hold on, your, you, your yeah. sound is popping out for a sec. Hold on. That Derek, I, yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to look through it and I was asking for some resources uh, from you and you pointed me to my own resources actually. So I started reading from um, St. Augustine's, uh, the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. So it's the first series, Augustine, uh, book number six, the Sermon on the Mount, um, uh, which is- I had it too, but yeah. I've yet to- I've yet to dive into this one yet. I've dived into the uh, the confessions and yeah. a bit of the city of God, uh, but none, mm -hmm. uh, none of his, uh, oh, and some of this with um, his scripture commentaries and the grace for grace and the Bible and the Holy Fathers for Orthodox. They, mm -hmm. they pull a lot of his commentary from, from, from here actually. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm not, I've, I've read some of the city of God back when I was in uh, college and, you know, mm -hmm. it was a political course, science course, but I had no, context don't remember it at all so when i popped it open here and i started reading i was like wow this is uh really wonderful and something that stuck out to me is what you said is how it's the uh the ten commandments for christians and i was like whoa you know that that stuck you know stuck i in my i head. i'm i'm 99 sure i've read that from somewhere so don't give me credit for it i think i might have actually i think i might have yeah if you go to the ancient faith store Mm -hmm. There are scripture commentaries, the Lawrence Farley set. I haven't bought it yet, but I per, I looked through it. And I think the um, the trendy title that they gave for the commentary on Matthew was the Torah for Christians or the Torah for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And I think from there, I sort of logically deduced, oh, yeah. And the Beatitudes are like the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. So well, yeah. It kind of sprung that yeah. there. So, yeah. yeah. I just don't want to get all the credit for that. <laughs> and uh, actually, St. Augustine. I think he says this in, in the beginning of the chapter here, he talks about how uh, the 10 commandments are the um, rules for building civilization on earth. Right. And the Beatitudes are the rules for building civilization, in the kingdom of heaven, which is a, a profound thing to think through. Um, and I've been the 10 commandments in these kind of patristic readings of the 10 commandments have affected me tremendously in the last year and a half. So I wanted to see, you know, if we can look at the similarities, the differences, the distinctions, the resonances between the Ten Commandments, right? And then what, what's happening with Christ in the, the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mound. Um, so I don't know, we could, you want to look at the Ten Commandments a little bit first and kind of see, how, you know. Yeah, um, I've actually, if I, in any way, if I would have prepared this, I would have brought this up, but uh, this could be helpful. I remember a while back, two years ago, I, um, I did teach Sunday school to high school uh, ages uh, and I had some middle school aged kids sneak in because they wanted to see what I had to say mm -hmm. um, but let me take a screenshot somehow send this to you I made this I took Matthew Pajot's heaven and earth and um, um, you know of course man the human person the human he post us is kind of uh, mitigating it all mm -hmm. or not mitigating but mediating it yeah, all yeah. it has to be unmitigated right so and so I took all that and I, I ran with it regarding the Ten Commandments. And I made this graphic um, based off of what Christ said to in mm -hmm. to the scribe re regarding the two great commandments. Okay. Uh, let me, <laughs> this is. Yeah, send it over through Messenger if you can, or you can yeah, email it. Let me uh, make a screenshot, take a screenshot rather. 
I was, uh, well, while you're doing that, I was looking to do a separate email because I have this email that I've had for 15 years and it's filled up with junk. So I'm like, I want to do yeah. a specific email for, you know, the podcast and for the channel. So um, I was thinking of one and one popped into my head while I was driving just a, an hour ago. Uh, mind the noose. Mind the noose. I'm like, sent oh. it to you. Yeah. Oh, cool. So I, I popped it up and nobody's taken it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like a double pun, you know, mind the noose, like it's the noose, but also mind it, you know. Uh, it also came through with uh, the recent Lord of Spirits podcast. They were talking about the noose, which, you know, a lot of good stuff in that. Did you hear it? Did you listen to it? The more recent one? No, I'm still catching up. I think I'm about halfway through the Lord of Spirits. Um, yeah. But one thing I did, I, I picked this up too. Um, this is actually, this was brought to my attention a little few days ago and i actually live like 20 30 minutes away from the ancient faith publisher of uh, the publishing house in chester in indiana mm -hmm. so whenever i order books from ancient faith they come in like a day because it's, it's kind of fun nice. <laughs> um so the holy angels by mother alexandra mm -hmm. this is the probably the best um a, uh, exposition on angels in terms of what's found in scripture and what's found in our tradition. I started reading this um, about 10 pages in, but it's from a Romanian former, uh, I think she was a Romanian princess who eventually became a nun, if I'm not mistaken. And she was able to apprehend the angelic beings early on in her lifetime. Mm. And she wrote about uh, her, yeah, her name is Mother Alexandra. And so this is uh, really cool. Just a basic overview of the, the nine ranks of angels, uh, the, their appointments, their allotments in terms of um, assisting in um, God's economia, his um, filling out or, yeah, filling out his his energy, so to speak, if I could tie it to the theology. Yeah. So this is really cool uh, for, from what I've started to read. So um, I feel like it should be pre preliminary reading for people who go into the Lord of Spirits, but yeah, I think yeah, uh, you have been more responsible than anyone recently for uh, increasing my uh, costs for books. Uh, yeah, that's a, I, I suffer up. from that too. <laughs> Every three days, my wife's like, here's another one. I'm like, it could be worse. You know, human beings are the beings that addict, right? So we addict, you know, that's just what we do. But choose the right things to point your, uh, your uh, I was, <laughs> desire towards, right? The uh, Life of the Virgin Mary um, volume, I, I probably shouldn't tell you about that one because that, that one's a lot more expensive. But she, um, Father Josiah Trenum talked about it. So, so mm -hmm. But I, I remember in the, I think it talks about St. Ambrose of Milan. In this, this goes with um, your recent discussions on the Mother of God, actually. Mm -hmm. But this might be a little bit of a Western perspective, but it's not necessarily a wrong one. But I even remember... Rachel Brown, uh, Dr. Rachel Fulton Brown mentioned this to Jonathan in their older interview, but um, according to St. Ambrose in the Mother of God's early life, she uh, would uh, occupy herself with study, much study of the law, the Old Testament, and the histories of, the, of her people and all that. And one of the fruits of being a lover of truth, who is the person of Christ, you know, who was born in her, is that you will eventually have this love for learning and um, studious intellect right and you yeah. see that in like the old testament with uh, uh daniel and, and whatnot so yeah. uh i was all, all that to say that she would preoccupy herself with reading tons of books so you're if that's what our holy mother did then it's not a bad thing for you to do right yeah right and that goes with the beatitude right blessed are those mm -hmm. that thirst for righteousness that hunger mm -hmm. and thirst for righteousness um exactly so yeah i would i would keep moving towards that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I can put actually I can share the screen here. If you want to walk us through mm -hmm. your, um, your okay, diagram here. Let me, let me see if I yeah. Can so it. it's, it's just a further application of this was back in 2019 when I had imbibed Matthew's book. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really ran with the concepts and I started to make my, my own diagrams to help in Sunday school, because a lot of these concepts just click together perfectly when you have a visual aid for people. Yeah. And I, I remember showing this, we, we had gone through some of Genesis a few months prior. So they were used to seeing this, the diagram on the left, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Matthew diagram. Yeah. And when, when I showed them this, they, 
their head, their faces lit up like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Yeah. Take and, me through it. Take us through a little bit here. I think I hope everybody can see it when we yeah. share it. Um, this is um this is basically a visual expansion of what Christ himself said in some point uh, throughout the Gospels mm -hmm. um, to the scribes when they would ask him, which is the greatest of the commandments. And this ties beautifully with, I guess, uh, what we're talking about with the, the sermon. But he you see him do this with the Beatitudes and later on in the sermon. But Christ is always, you can say, revealing the underlying principle behind everything that people just don't seem to get something that they should get or that they should like i think saint paul talks about the law as the schoolmaster or the the the, the greek word was the pedagogue mm -hmm. so the schoolmaster which is visible on the right should signify things toward the left right the mm -hmm. the seat of meaning right the logi behind mm -hmm. it all uh, but they don't obviously they don't get it and they have to go to Christ for him to <laughs> spell it out for them. Yeah. So the diagram on the left is is the uh, visual aid from Matthew's book. You've seen it a million times if you're part of the symbolic world. Mm -hmm. um, the text, obviously, in the uh, the center, that's part of the Lord's Prayer that he himself revealed. Christ himself revealed uh, to the disciples when they asked him, how how shall we pray? And he said, you, you will pray in this manner and, and proceeded the Lord's Prayer. And then the section in the middle are the two great commandments. Christ says that all the commandments of the law, all of the law and the prophets can hang on these two commandments. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, and it's basically an, an, an injunction for a, a, a liturgical character, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the people near him and with the principalities and uh the uh the heavenly seeds above him so to speak right mm -hmm. yeah and then that that further delineates out into the law and then each of these 10 commandments can be further divided and you mentioned that with uh saint augustine when it comes to the blueprints for building a society on earth mm -hmm. right yeah. so uh it's just a uh i guess fulfillment of what christ himself said yeah and tying I, all these yeah. ideas together so there you go i, I like how the, uh, the the torah the the law was there to kind of you know support the humans and show them how to build relationships and build civilization and then when christ came it's like then the you know the, the, it's kind of inverted it and you know you're not there for the law the law is there for you it kind of yeah. uh, a lot of this inversion and there was this uh idea of the mountain right when um christ when, uh, uh, when christ revealed or god revealed the ten commandments god came down uh to the top of the mountain right and then the multitudes had to uh, move away from the mountain uh, for Moses mm -hmm. to go up and receive the law. Here, God went up the mountain, right? And the multitudes gathered. So there's this uh, inversion and this distinction of God coming down in the Torah and then God coming up and Christ walking up the mountain. And then the differentiation between the multitudes being pushed away and now the multitudes coming together. So it's really this beautiful symbolic kind of integration that uh it's, it's like that apophatic and cataphatic breathing in and breathing out that you see i know stanny Lloyd talks about that all the time yeah yeah and it, it's yeah. that applied on a larger scale actually so that's cool yeah he talks about it in terms of uh um reason and the mystery right the um mm -hmm. the cataphatic is the uh the rat not the rational but like kind of the, the logos Right. Mm -hmm. And then the apophatic is the, the mystery. And it reminded me of the yin yang. Right. You have the mystery mm -hmm. in the in the rational, the mystery in the logos and you have the logos in the mystery. So they kind of uh, they're interrelated and, and linked in with each other. Uh, and through that, we can kind of discern the pattern of, of Christ, the pattern of the logos in the world, you know, through relationships, through observation, um, through all of our human faculties. Yeah, really wonderful stuff. I appreciate you bringing that to, to my attention as well. Um, so what is this? So the first commandment, right? Have no other gods besides me. What is it? Is he a jealous God? What do you mean to have no other gods beside me? That seems like why would anybody believe in a God that is jealous and be selfish for all that focus like that? I'm just saying kind of this is what the critique is. The, the, yeah, yeah. This you know, this reminds me of uh, St. Paisios of Mount Athos, actually, when pe people asked him about the sort, the meanness or the violence in the Old Testament, right? And mm -hmm. He answered quite simply, like, my child, this is the people of that time. This is all they knew. They had to be 
reined in through this kind of brutality. And he says that even like a murderer today, uh, someone by modern sensibilities that we might consider immoral, even they have some sense of morality. They at least know what they're doing is wrong, but they take pleasure in it. Mm-hmm. People back then, they didn't even have that basic uh, 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 conscience, you know, that yeah. basic principle in their conscience. And that's, mm-hmm. uh, I guess that shows the devastation that happened after the flood and the Tower of Babel, if you, if you want to fall back into that history, but how far things really have fallen and why it took all of this history in order to bring about, you know, the incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, um, so it's important. That's a super important distinction to make. Cause I think it's something, a trap that we fall into now, even in the secular space of applying our modern sensibilities to, let's say the forefathers to say, Hey, they own slaves. You know, how could they have been uh, revered now when they own slaves back then? It's like, there wasn't an option back then. You know, slavery was the, mm-hmm. not to go on a tangent was the way of the world for most of the world. You know, and it's like, yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't always as bad as people made it out to be, because at least if in the Deuteronomic laws, when Moses talked about slavery, there was a limit to how long someone could be a slave to you Mm -hmm. uh, before manumission. And most of the relationships, at least in the time of the Hebrews and even in like the Roman times, for example, a lot of their um, the slaves continue to have great relationships with their former slave owners. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the point where the they would still help raise the children and and whatnot. So it was a kind of um, in the same way now that we have the uh, dynamic of the sponsor, the godparent, and the spiritual mm-hmm. father. All these sort of um, odd extra, these imposed relationships to help bridge the gap in communities. Slavery was viewed as that, and of course there were moments where people would exploit that. And even Moses, and I think it was Deuteronomy twenty three, talks about. If a slave comes to you from um, if slave comes to you from a former family, I'm paraphrasing, then you are to treat him like your own child. He is to take refuge in the best uh, room that you have to offer. You are to provide him with provisions and whatnot. So there was, um, I, I had to get on that rant because that's one thing that uh, when people talk about slavery. They they blanket on, under what they perceive to be slavery from uh, like the american the early american times right but that's yeah. not and, it's and not even, even close to what it was like my my atheist sorry to rant my atheist latin teacher um when we were talking about this is back when i was in high school even she was like look i don't care what you think you know about slavery i want you to throw that out the window because it's completely different in the ancient times so even they knew it you know people basic people who studied history without any with a bias against the scriptures or whatever you know well, to, to add a little more nuance mm-hmm. there, like even in the American, uh, the time of American slavery, right? And this is very controversial, but in no way, shape or form am I advocating slavery or, or qualifying oh, yeah, it or justifying Definitely. it, right? But there was love between the, sla- like, you know, they lived together, right? They had children yeah. together and there were horrific, uh, you know, manifestations of this relationship, obviously, thank God that it's been ameliorated. But there was there was love there in a lot of the cases, and it's like now we have a, a world where there's no love in corporations. So now we work at corporations, right, for money, right. So technically, we're not slave slaves because we can go home and and whatnot. But there is almost no instantiation of this love between, let's say, the leadership of a corporation and, and its people. Uh, and that was, yeah, that love of yeah. the hierarchy that Jonathan talks about all the time. You know, that above yeah. loving that below. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, thank God that we've moved away from slavery, but there's a, a lot of nuance there that I think is important to bring up, especially uh, kind of these days. Um, another kind exactly. of uh, implication of have no other gods besides me is, is yeah. again, remember the, the Decalogue is the, um, the blueprint, how to build a kingdom on earth, the civilization from kind of the ground up level. Um, so civilizations in different societies and people and cultures would build and worship particular gods for a particular place or time or community or a natural um, phenomenon, right? So, and that would necessarily lead to destruction because you would have other tribes or whatnot that have different gods. And anytime you invest your desire, your human will into a an idol, right? You, you build idols in a sense. So I think the first- yeah, you host is, you host angels or you host spirits. That's the language that Matthew used in his book. And yeah. of course, if, if you've been following Lord of Spirits, you know that there's that's more true than 
you might even you might realize, right? Yeah, more so, real than real, uh, in a exactly. sense, right? So the idea is, uh, all right, you want to build a civilization uh, on mm -hmm. Earth. Here's the first rule: don't invest your human desire in anything lower than the one infinite mystery, right? If you you're not that is that where you're aiming to sin is to aim away from this, right? And it's not knowable in its essence, and it's very, uh, you know, it's not easy to find that and plug into it, right? You have to have, you know, a relatively good intentions and a relatively purified heart to even, you know, to even get uh, into that um, kind of understanding. But the idea is, you know, you plug into the infinite, the one infinite mystery. And from there, your desire is not going to be situated into this rivalrous, mimetic rivalrous game that builds up uh, tensions and sins in a community and, and eventually leads to destruction and chaos. So like, here's the yeah. first rule humans don't invest your human desire in on earthly things, at least ultimately, or it will eventually lead to ruin, you know? So I, I think, yeah. that, you know, I think that's, a, that was a, an, an interesting implication that, that kind of stood out to me. And I think it goes to the second point of uh, do not make for yourself an idol. Um, and this isn't just, you know, uh, statues, golden statues of, of bulls or whatever it may be. You can make something like orthodoxy an idol. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's how you invest your desire, how you approach whatever it may be. It, it, you know, determines whether it's an idol or an ideology, right? Or whether it's something that it, it, it has to have its appropriate place in the hierarchy, I think. Um, this is where this is where the apophatic way of living. I thought St. Gregory Paramas says it, I believe we have to live apophatically and that's seeming contradiction. Like you have to exist and then exist in a way that's dissolutive to your person. Right. If you think about it, but that's, I think, aims at fulfilling the first two commandments, which are crucial because um, all the practices that, that the church suggests for us, fasting, prayer, uh, giving things up, it's voluntary, we, you know, the use of the language of picking up your cross, they're voluntary, uh, you can say diving into death, so to speak, that allows these parts of you to be ripped off and then refashioned properly, even more properly towards uh, God himself, right, uh, what you're commanded to do in the first, uh, first commandment, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about, is that the church is constantly thinking of ways to um, or suggesting ways for us to not only uh, detach ourselves from the influence of the fallen world, but at the same time does provide for us, you can say lawful idols, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So St. John of Damascus, I think uses this language in his treatise on the divine images. Uh, he was defending iconoclasm. Uh, I might've been his first treatise. I don't remember. There, there were three in total, but he talks about how, you know, I will venerate that matter that um, that God assumed uh, that, the, that the divinity chose to indwell, right? Mm -hmm. And he mentions the idea of um, being provided with an idol for us to, uh, a, a lawful idol for us to to venerate, right? And he makes the distinction between latria and proskinesis, right? And of course, that, that gets expanded with um, the saints and the relics and everything that, that our church gives. It's... Uh, like reconstituting this image of uh, the Garden of Eden in, in a way. I think that's what St. Irenaeus of Leon talks about the church and everything she provides for us as like fruit from different trees in Eden. Yeah. So it's and like think, building yeah. us back to that in, in initial state or that in, initial beauty. So it's at the same time pulling things away from us, but then offering it back to us in a purified way. So it's this, it's this dance, this hoti that we have to, to manage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's well said. And, and kind of an anecdote that comes to mind is so somebody was mm -hmm. asking a question on the Lord of Spirits Facebook page and I responded and I almost didn't want to respond because I didn't know if I communicated appropriately. They said, you know, I have a friend, a very dear friend who's a great person, compassionate person that I work with. And they are, we're going hiking together. And this person said, Hey, I'm going to give you their, she's really into new age this friend is i'm going to give you two crystals you can take with you when we go on the hike and the question this person asked was you know what should i do with these crystals should i throw them away should i tell her you know i'm a christian i don't do this and my thought was you know take them with you like you know if if these items are appropriately placed in the hierarchy you're not worshiping the crystal you're not revering it right 
it could, but using that as a way to commune with your friend, right. And maybe open up a space where you can share you know, the logos can come through, right? You can use these things. And it, it reminded me of this idea of, you know, the Christian Orthodox Christianity, when it goes to different cultures, you know, it doesn't destroy even the, the, the lower kind of gods of that culture, right? It transfigures them and it places them in the appropriate place in the hierarchy because there's a place for everything, right? But it's, it's tricky though, because, you know, I don't know that uh, what, at what level you'd have to be in terms of your path towards theosis to be appropriately, appropriately placed, things like that, which, you know, um, can be very tricky into the hierarchy. So I don't know what you would think about that. That's, um, that reminds me of, uh, was it St. Innocent of Alaska or St. Herman of Alaska? I forget. It was one of the two, but uh, they were at the point of theosis or a very high spiritual state. So they were just glowing with the grace of God. And I think in the Aleutian culture or one of the native cultures up there in Alaska, they had this long forgotten sensibility or idea of like, like a demigod or of this kind of um, divine like person. So they had this idea of what we would call a saint mm -hmm. of true sanctity. But of course we, we know after the, um, after Babel, the reverse Pentecost, so to speak, all of this was confused over time as the whole earth was overspread. But when they came into contact with a saint, someone who was embodying the grace of God, who was embodying Christ, they immediately identified him as this kind of demigod figure just by being in his presence. They felt it. Mm -hmm. And um, shortly after, shortly thereafter, they were to spread orthodoxy uh, there. And many were baptized and even some yeah. of the saints there. Uh, more saints were, uh, I don't know what the word is, not made, but yeah, not no, canonized. But yeah, yeah. So that's something that uh, I thought that was interesting. Also, it is, I guess, this extension of the Great Commission where, uh, Christ has already destroyed death. He's already deified our human nature, but it's bringing that news to the ends of the earth and allowing people to choose to participate in that or not, to take their place with the sheep or the goats. Yeah. And that's something that we're tasked with continuing on. I mean, after all this time, it's still orthodoxy, at least in America, is still something that most people don't know about. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. And, and another uh, thing that, that came to mind here from the Lord of Spirits, um, oh man, I think it just slipped from my mind actually. Um, oh, oh ah, man, I just like felt it come out uh, here. Um, let me see, think here. Uh, yeah, let's see if it comes back to me here. Oh, Becoming yeah, they, an they, angel? <laughs> no, they, they, well, they talked about, um, and I didn't hear it on the podcast, but somebody referenced it on the podcast of the, um, you know, Christ came and, you know, his final words said, it is finished. If it is finished mm -hmm. and the devil has been defeated, then why are we still going through this, you know, tumultuous time? And um, the idea of uh, that came through was that, you know, like D-Day was the event that ended mm -hmm. the, the world war, but that didn't end the war as such. There's still mm -hmm. time and events that happened after D-Day, right, which led all, ultimately to the, uh, the end of the war. So I think mm -hmm. that was a, something that stood out to me is like this idea, yeah, the event happened, right? Uh, humanity was was um, was rescued, right? Was resurrected by Christ going down into Hades, to the very bottom, grabbing you know Adam and Eve and pulling them up, and at that same time transfigured the human race, but also life itself and the earth, right? So it's not the just the transfiguration of the human being, right? That is the um, kind of penultimate, but also the human being's relationship to life, to nature, to animals. Right. So it's actually saving the earth it, it's itself. Right. Uh, which is a profound thing to, to consider that is actually true. That's something that's like what that we're happens. that's what we do in the liturgies. And I think that's the loss of this, the loss of this conscious feeling um, that like we used to have, I think, is a real tragedy because uh, in the petitions at the beginning of the liturgy, we do go through the heavens and the earth. Right. The different. Uh, uh, even those who travel, ironically, those who travel by air, we didn't have that in the past, but it still fits in this cosmic pattern. But we go through the whole creation and asking for God and his in his energies to to deify this place, to heal it. And that's mm -hmm. uh, it's our job. I mean, when you don't go to church, <laughs> you're you're missing out on that on the very structure of the world itself, receiving its medicine, so to speak. Yeah. And that's become 
that's become uh, heavily trivialized now because uh, we tend to view church as this performance, not a liturgy, which mm -hmm. is actually a, a work. In fact, yep. it ties into it ties into the essence and the energies where the energies are called down and we are participating in that mm -hmm. yeah. with, within ourselves and then uh, supposedly carrying that out throughout the whole week. So it is a kind of recreation yeah. that's constantly happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Well, well said. I think it's a, uh, it's an important thing. And Jonathan Peugeot talks about how, you know, and, and I kind of had this idea as well of like how, you know, that since the 18th century, it's like the organic Christian ethos has been paved over by like, uh, you know, cement, right? So any mm -hmm. ideas of church is this performative propositional understanding of what you're doing at, at church, you're receiving some moral, uh, you know, lecture from uh, some, some priest or whatever it may be, but it's something to participate in Like from the orthodox perspective, you are participating in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. and healing yourself and others by going in participate participating in, in the sacraments and being in what is essentially heaven on earth, right? Christ's, body, it, Christ's body is distributed through space and time since it's in, in, in initiation for thousands of years. You have his body that, that is here for us to participate in. And if you do it, you will feel him. He will come to you. Like in Matthew, you know, I have a, uh, something that I have here uh, on a poster, uh, Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find it, knock, and it will be opened to you. That will happen to anybody that really attempts that. Anybody, right? Mm -hmm. it, but you have if to you take really it want seriously. It. Yeah, you have to take mm -hmm. it seriously. You have to, you know, get rid of all the baggage, all of the cultural baggage that we have about, you know, Christianity and, and look at it through new eyes. Give it six months and do it intensely. You're, it will change you. Um, yeah. It might not. And that's that, yeah. that's why for me, like I I used to be in my I guess toward my high school days, I used to wrestle with these ideas like, oh, well, you know, what if I if I was never given orthodoxy or I was never provided with uh, this sort of bumper crop or this backup battery at the start of my life <laughs> to uh, pursue him. And then I these verses would come to mind and some more of the wisdom of St. Baisios would come to mind where I, he would say things like, well, the reason why you went all throughout all your life without ever having come to close contact with the scriptures, without ever having understood anything, uh, your ignorance is your own fault because you did not seek after Christ in your heart, so he did not reveal himself to you, so it's your fault. And yeah. as I started to go more and more through life and contemplating my, my own faults, the faults of those around me, the consequences of those faults, and then even the, by God's grace, the subtle successes that I've had and the successes I've seen other people have, it's starting to dawn on me now, yeah, I'm completely responsible for everything that's happened to me, and so are you, mm -hmm. and I do not feel, we, we are to show charity and compassion, of course, to help people, we're, we're not to be cold-hearted, obviously, but that's, but still underlying all that, it's like, well, whatever's happened to you is your own doing, buddy. Mm -hmm. And I've started to more and more uh, come to accept that. And so yeah. there's a sense of freedom that comes with that, uh, a, a way to help us forgive each other. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, uh, other things there, so I got distracted. But I think I had something else. I forget what else I wanted to say. But um, also minor, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the uh, to go back to John of Damascus, when he makes that distinction between Latria and Proskinesis, the word for make uh, the word for idol is actually the same word that we use for worship, latria, mm -hmm. um, idolatria. So Christ, obviously, his incarnation is an answer to that. That we're mm -hmm. actually allowed to have an idol, and the idol is his person, his deified flesh. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'm, I meant to say that earlier, but it came back to me. But but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what what kind of came to me when you were when you were. Um talking about this idea of uh, taking responsibility for your, oh, I, your life. I knew what I wanted to say. I, I, I knew what I wanted to say. It was um, uh, onto the ritual thing. Uh, back in the time of well, the communist days in Russia, they would, because they were under this Western mindset that you've li uh, lined out where you go to perform and you receive some kind of moral instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, the communists thought that, well, the best way to destroy the faithful people there um, because they were under this paradigm, this Western uh, paradigm, the best way to destroy the Orthodox was actually to prohibit the sermon. 
It's like, yeah, you can have this little ritual that you do, the liturgy, whatever, but just don't, the priests can't teach you anything. And if they yeah. stop teaching you, then you won't be Christian anymore because you won't learn anything. It never happened. Yeah. You know, so they, they allowed them to eat and drink the body and blood of God himself, which sustained them throughout all that. But because, but even though their minds were not being filled with theology. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to say. I thought that was, so that blind spot of the West actually saved the Russian people. Anyway. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's that beautiful. Yeah. But well mm-hmm. said. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you were saying earlier, you know, how you were taking your, you know, as you were maturing in your life and thinking through things, taking more responsibility for your actions and, and yourself. And, and I think the, from the, um, from the law perspective is we take responsibility for our actions. We pick up our cross and bear it. But I think at that next level, right. Is to take responsibility for others sins. Is that, Mm -hmm. you think the beatitudes or that next level to get to live on the kingdom of heaven, right. That's why one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the saints always say, I'm, I'm, you know, there's no bigger sinner than me. Right. So it's, it's, I think, do you think there's a, a development that happens once you, once you really take responsibility for your actions, then you take responsibility for others' actions. And it's a weird thing to say though. Like you're not taking mm-hmm. responsibility as you're to blame, but it's like you are, they're part of your body. They're part of, you know, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Like exactly. the, the Lord's prayer is just the first two lines or the first two words, you know, our father, right? So it it gives you this idea of the relation between God and humanity is one of Mm -hmm. a parent and a child. And it's not my father, it's our father, right? So it's, it's those two words right there just tell us so much about the relationship between, you know, us as human beings with each other and with, with the infinite, uh, through, you know, Mm -hmm. through the, through these words of the logos that, that came to show us. So, um, yeah, his father too, he's speaking of his own father as well as ours. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah. cool. So, um, so would you say that the first commandment, the first three really are related, right? Have no other gods besides me plug into the, the one infinite, you know, creator of heaven mm-hmm. and earth. Uh, do not make an idol for yourself. We talked to that. Do not misuse the name of the Lord, your God. Um, I, um, I used misuse. That's actually closer to the Hebrew. Um, um, the original meaning is do or rather do not carry or misuse. It's a hard to exp- uh, express, but uh, the King James renders it as do, do not uh, take it in vain. Mm-hmm. Um, because his name I, is hallowed, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hallowed be thy name. So how do we understand that in terms of, what is it? Don't curse using God's name. Don't say, you know, gee, damn, or whatever it may be. How do we mm-hmm. think through that particular commandment, you think? I've always, one of the things that, that I could be wrong about this, but one of the things that I um, thought about with the third commandment was that it has to do with uh, your, your own conduct or your, the, your own character. You do see this to a perfected extent when you look at the saints or people who, who knew holy people like Elder Ephraim of Arizona, for example. I, I know people who, who knew him uh, and just being and being near them, they didn't even have to say a word because the, the their own character, their own presence was uh, deified to such an extent that it you could feel it like a, being near a, a blazing campfire, for example. So, yeah, uh, I think that um, I don't know exactly if that has to do with the third commandment, but I've I've always been drawn to that idea where, well, do you reflect the name of God. And of course the idea of a name is very, you're reading like the religion of the apostles or how mm-hmm. it's understood in uh, um, the old Testament where to carry the name of something or to name or to, to understand the name of something, to declare something. We see that in Genesis, right? Where Adam was apprehending the creatures and then he, he calls out their, 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 their inner principle. So to be right. So to carry or to take or to misuse or to have the name of God in you, it's signifier of your own image Mm -hmm. and to how, uh, to what extent you are fulfilling the potential um, grace in that image. I'm I'm thinking of like St. Maximus right now, where he talks about um, we're all made in the image, but to be in the likeness of God is to fully actualize the implications of that. So, Mm -hmm. and I think that, I think that's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That last part, it gives me hints of the beatitudes like the building 
the kingdom of heaven, right? And the idea of don't misuse the name of the Lord, your God. What just came to me when you were talking there was, was don't, and I think this is relevant for our times, don't be capricious with identity, right? Identities, you know, what's happening now with the dissolution and ambiguous and um, ambiguous identities and you know, identities aren't real, they're socially constructed. I think to a point, yes, right? But that social construction is important, like, you know, and it's root, you know, whether it's rooted in biology, which obviously it kind of has to be, right? But don't be capricious with identities, uh, you know, on uh, the ultimate identity, the ultimate is the name of, of God, right? So I don't know if uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, lands. And all. also, like, for example, like, I, what came to mind, too, is um, the Antichrists. Um, mm -hmm. Father Seraphim Rose says, uh, or he, he references St. John, he who does not confess um, the Father and the Son, he is Antichrist, Antichristo. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes along with the name here. And he, uh, Father Seraphim Rose expounds on that in his introduction on his book on nihilism. And he says, the real, who, who are the real antichrists? Are they the atheists? Are they the pagans? Are they those who've never heard of Christ? He says, no, no. The real antichrists are those in the churches with Christ on their lips, but not in their hearts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, and, and I went, when I read that, I had such a sigh of relief when I read that. I, I'm not going to give any names, but we all know people and groups like that where, and we, we might have even been put off by that hypocrisy from ever visiting church at earlier parts in our life because of that, right? And Great it shows point. that not be, becoming an antichrist, an antichristo, well, the word antichrist means substitute Christ instead of yeah, Christ. Instead it doesn't of Christ, mean, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean against Christ. It's mm -hmm. bound up with that. But I think that that's another application of this commandment is, to take this calling seriously and what it represents, you know, it's part of why we take three years to catechize people so that they fully understand, or we used to, at least St. Cyril's time they did, yeah. but the catechisms were very serious and uh, the name of Christ and we're constantly called to uh, call upon his name in the Jesus prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. everything that the you can say, everything that the infinite or the unessential essence from whom or from which everything has proceeded that we will never fully understand the implications of that so there's this calling to constantly uphold this this reverence yeah right yeah wonderful yeah that's a great point about the uh this kind of uh antichrist spirit of the antichrist being mm -hmm. in in the church and keeping people away from the church in a sense that that was my experience for many many years mm -hmm. um it's a great point uh something else that kind of came to mind was you know uh, don't misuse the name of lord your god right so don't um don't disregard the infinite within the finite right if you do that then you're going to destroy it like you you think you know the Nazi, it's like the then, Nazi then you end up in like a weird gnostic view where it's just oh well it's just stuff that's all the way up there, but there's none of that is imminent, right? And, or and, his influence or his name, right? And it's I think it's the, at the root of othering people, like you mm -hmm. know they become subhuman, like the like the the during the you know obviously uh, Nazi times, right? The the Jews yeah. were looked at as subhuman, right? So I think it mm -hmm. it resonates with this idea of don't misuse the name of the Lord your God, right? Don't don't misuse, don't disregard, don't be capricious with the infinite and the finite. Um, yeah, wonderful, man. I, I appreciate you, uh, engage me with this. this I've, I've never thought of yeah, me things, too. you know, uh, in, until kind of, uh, here talking with you here. So, um, I think we might have to do a part two, uh, to get to the Beatitudes, but I'm, I'm more than happy to continue with these though. Cause this is great. Oh yeah. So these four first, first section, what, what about the, uh, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Reason up, dude. What's that? Okay. No, you're, yeah, you're good now. No, you froze for a second, but we're good. Um, actually, I remember this could be, forgive me if this is a wrong thing, because the scripture, it doesn't necessarily say, uh, rem remember the Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath day, mm -hmm. the day of the Lord, right? The um, remembrance of um, the seventh day that the, where God rested and filled everything with his, his grace and his, his presence, so to speak. Um, I actually, this could be, I don't know if this was the right thing to do, but I took out the word day and I just kept it vague, um, the Sabbath, because the reason why, and forgive me 
God, if this is not a good way to do it, but I was, I was thinking about these first four commandments at all different levels. So mm -hmm. um, the Sabbath doesn't necessarily have to be restrictive to a particular day or a time of the week. I mean, we're called, for example, to, we're called to structure a prayer rule in our lives, right? So we mm -hmm. set out various markers uh, or various Sabbaths uh, throughout the day to allow us to reattune or rest in, uh, in the presence of God, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our icon corners with our incense and whatnot. So that's something that, and of course, the Sabbath day, which for us is the day of the liturgy where Christ resurrected. Mm -hmm. uh, we partake of his body and his blood. So that's the most intimate form of that. But that's, yeah. So yeah, I, I, the scripture says the Sabbath day, but yeah, that, yeah. that was something that I, um, I had contemplated there. Well, what are the different kinds of Sabbaths that we're supposed to have? And uh, I'm also re re reminded of uh, St. Porfirios, where he would constantly stress uh, keeping God's memory in your heart. Never forget, never forget your Christ, even for a second. Mm -hmm. And uh, that simple wisdom that our uh, Athenite saints like him would have. But, but yeah, that's something that it seems to tie, if I had to sum it up here, it seems to tie the first four together. Uh, and also, I don't, I don't know if the right word is to accentuate or deify the first three mm -hmm. even more. Yeah. I don't know. What did you have to say about that? Yeah. You know what? I really don't have, I haven't thought about it too much, but just from kind of uh, engaging with you here, you know, I like that idea of, uh, of it, you know, thinking of it in, in fractal terms is that what do we do in terms of, uh, you know, rest every day. And I think in terms of building civilization and building human relationships, you know, it can't just be about work. You know, uh, Matthew Peugeot talks about it in, in the language of creation. He talks about how you have these periods of work and rest in order for to, to develop an appropriate hierarchy. You have to have the, the day of rest, the day of appreciation of what you've or built. Right? The Sabbath year, even talk yeah. about fractals later on. And I think uh, le later on in the Pentateuch, God um, tells Moses that you are to rest the land on the seventh year, and on the sixth year, I will double your harvest or the uh, results of your crop. Mm, and that's something yeah. that uh, um, I noticed, too, because I was contemplating the Sabbath year, and then I was contemplating that the implications of that uh, in our society, and we don't really have that because we're constantly looking at things in, in terms of um, gradual increase or bottom lines, right? Just constant um, growth and exploitation. And then I thought to myself, oh, wait a minute, don't, didn't we kind of have like forced Sabbaths the past 20 years? I mean, think about it. We had 9-11, which was in 2001. That sort of sh shook the world or shook America up for a while, forcing us into a kind of remembrance of God. I mean, I, I remember a statistic that church attendance went, went up like crazy shortly mm -hmm. after that happened. And then you think of uh, as if we haven't learned anything, you have seven years later, you have the market crash in 2008, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. revealing to us our, uh, who it is we worship. I mean, come on, we worship mammon. It's an obvious thing. And then a little bit more than seven years, this wasn't exactly seven. This was more so 12. So seven and a half or whatever. We had this whole thing with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking to myself, I, I don't know if that fits exactly, but and of course, the fallout of, from what happened last year was far worse than mm -hmm. the other two. So I think that if we don't have, I mean, it's, it's not just something that's uh, arbitrarily imposed on by God. It actually reveals to us something about the metaphysics of this world mm -hmm. uh, that we have, to, we have to take things. And I think Derek uh, did a video on this last year, Combalancing Work and Rest, where we talked about that in the comment section. Yeah. Um, our friend Derek. Uh, but yeah, that was something that um, I noticed too. Like this is something about the structure of the world that when we forget, it becomes completely catastrophic. And of course, the ultimate expression of that is the flood, right? Yeah. And we do but, forget. But yeah. um, and you know, that just brought up, there's this, and I'm not this, if I try to think through this, it'll reveal my ignorance mm -hmm. of, of history, <laughs> right? There's also the same pattern same. with the number 70, right? Like yeah. 70 years ago, we had World War II. And then if you go 70 years by then, you get to the French Revolution. Like you get to the revolution and then all of the um, 
the, the uh, American Revolution, you know, the Civil War, it has this pattern of 70. It's like the fourth turning type thing that even secular people are starting to notice now, like supposedly from 20, 2008 to 2028, we're supposed to have a huge change in uh, the state of things, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. They, might be, they might be right, and there's something to that. And even, um, I know our you, you interviewed Michael Whitcoff or Brother Augustine, but he mentioned how when he was a Mason, even they had this understanding of the cycles of things, um, this in, intuition as to how reality lays itself out, right? Well, they're, of they're, they have a more, yeah, they're yeah. intuiting the pattern. Like the pattern is the pattern is the pattern. You know, it's your yeah. fidelity and your ability to discern the pattern, right? Uh, determines kind of your ability to kind of appropriate that information. But the just because these different uh, cultures or groups observe the pattern, like it's it, you know, like the secular and the spiritual matter and spirit are intertwined, interlinked, interconnected. There's no separation there in a sense, you know. Yeah. And I think it's just a, about how clear you you are seeing the pattern because you can discern like pattern like you're saying the fourth turning right so whether you're secular or spiritual i think there's there's not a distinction there but i think there's it's an important to and again it comes with the, like in the beatitudes it talks about blessed are those uh with a pure heart right uh for you know they were inherit they were inherit the kingdom of heaven you know so it's like that pure yeah. heart is what allows you to discern the wisdom which is enfolded in all of reality in a sense yeah um and just before we move on uh, you know yeah that's the word too uh to kind of cap this commandment i it just sort of dawned on me but the use of the word remember mm -hmm. he doesn't say keep the sabbath he says remember it mm. so it's as if it's that presupposes that there's something underlying your experience there that you can't forget or else it will come back and haunt you. So that does seem to justify, I guess, what we've been hinting at there. But yeah, but it's yeah, it's right there in plain sight. Remember the Sabbath, not keep the Sabbath, um, which is an interesting yeah. kind of. And and yeah. to remember is to bring you back can't not keep body. it because yeah. it's how the world is. Yeah, yeah. To to remember, you'll have to re. If you forget it, you'll have to remember it, attach it back to your member, like right, and that guy can happen yeah. in a catastrophic way. Um, and this idea of you know seven times seven is forty nine, right? Every mm -hmm. 49 years, they had, you know, um, a jubilee, right? Where all debts mm -hmm. were forgiven, all things were forgiven. Uh, and exactly. I think that's, there's been some talk in, in uh, you know, the cognitive science and, and kind of the game B space about how can we reincorporate and, and think through a jubilee, right? Debt forgiveness, yeah. what we see with the student loan debt. And it's not like, you know, again, these are the rules to build civilization. If you want civilization to grow and continue, like these are fundamental source code that you need to implement. Right. It's not mm -hmm. about, oh, it's not fair if somebody has debt that you forgive it. Right. It's not for us to discern what's good or bad. Like what, the ancient wisdom is there and it's there for a reason. And it's been, you know, carried through the uh, millenniums for a reason. And disregarding yeah. it will lead to disaster. In a sense. There's a real ontology. There's a real metaphysic to things that people, you can't just bypass it because you choose not to, because, oh, we live in a technologically advanced age now. So, yeah, uh, you can't just ignore your duties before God, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I don't believe in God. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you're gonna suffer not believing Him either one way or another, and you can use whatever word you want for Him, even if you pay to surface level obeisance. This is the one thing that I I love Jordan Peterson. I love the um, or at least I I should say I love the struggle that he has. I can tell that he's struggling for it, but this is the one thing that he. Um, it may be easy for me to say, but to jump between, well, I act as though God exists to, do you accept him in the very, uh, do you accept him in your heart? Do you love Christ, mm -hmm. your God? It's not just the idea of Christ or the perception of some kind of grand archetype that encapsulates all the other Jungian archetypes. It's like, well, no, he is a theanthropic hypostasis that came to heal you. He didn't come to impress you. He didn't come to give you knowledge. He came to heal you because he loves you. And it's that, and then to show you how things work and not just things in this world, but the one to come. And yeah. this does, I think, I guess it kind of ties into the moving into the Beatitudes because the presence of Christ in the law is implied. It can be deduced. It can be um, after the fact, right? You can sort of view reality at, from this way, like, oh, I act as though he exists. You can sort of fit that in here. But when it comes time to go towards the Beatitudes or to the full revelation uh, of the embrace of, of this, of this person withheld from the ages. I mean, what does that, 
what does that even imply? What does that mean? And that's the Orthodox Church does provide an answer for that, despite the fact that we ourselves do not live in that space very well. Yeah, I think uh, to your point, you can see him, uh, especially in this mm-hmm. talk with Jonathan, how, uh, you know, how so much he's so much under so much pressure when he starts considering the reality mm-hmm. of believing in God. What if it's real and he just tears up and you can see like it's the idea of this gnashing of teeth. Right. And it's not to punish. Right? It's to call you to mm-hmm. repentance. It's to call you to join the kingdom of heaven. Right. Like you're acting yeah. as if God exists. You have to act through god's existence in a sense like keep going and that that pressure will gird up your loins gird up your that's why throughout the old testament whenever god wanted to speak to someone they were terrified in that same way they were like i can't do this or even if they saw an angel or an emissary of this god Mm -hmm. um they would just fell and yeah the seraphim are are, 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 terrifying not seraphim but but yeah um (laughs) But he would say it throughout the Old Testament, like, gird up your loins, like, nut up and come talk to me. Mm-hmm. I'll help you. And that's something that I feel Jordan is in that state where um, he did not come to give you this, this full, because he's still viewing it from that purely moralistic side of things where yeah, the, but I think the acceptance, no, like, and I'm not being harsh. I'm not being super harsh on him either. I, I'm just trying to. Well, I think it's. Uh, I can be harsh on him, but from a good way. So that I, 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 I don't disagree with you, but I think maybe there's something there to watching him, you mm-hmm. know, wrestle with it, right? And in, in that gap in between, which is opening a space for others to come into it. You know, if he just mm-hmm. automatically said, you know, oh, I believe in God now, like right, he's like kind of holding space in a very. He's still playing way. an important role. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not doubting that either. Yeah. Yeah, he's acting like an attractor of of myself. So many people I've talked to uh, are you know are going through, you know, his struggle towards their own understanding and struggles in a sense. So I don't disagree with you, right, about his, you know, he, uh, you know, about what his personal situation is and what he could do from our perspective, but the actual effects that he's had um, are are profound. I don't think we really understand it, especially thinking of where yeah. we were before him. I don't think it was, he was the singular point of it. He was riding a wave that was there anyways, but I think he was mm-hmm. kind of articulating it and acted like an attractor for a lot of people, especially with he, the biblical he, lecture studies to look again with new eyes and just take it seriously. Like, you know, that's he, it. He seems to echo, he seems to echo uh, Barlam, the Barlamite character that the the big debate between Saint Gregory Palamas and Barlam about the uh, the distinction between God's essence and His energies and trying to uh, how are we to conceive and even participate in God right and this is something that I feel he is the culmination of the of the caution that Saint Gregory Palamas said you know if you do not make a clear distinction between what God is and his energies, how his, how his personal presence is unfolded in creation. If you do not make that distinction, you will end up in atheism. You will end up not, you, you will end up in um, the warning from Matthew 24, when Christ says, Uk mas, I never knew you. You know, he looked towards them and says, I never knew you. And I think deep down, I, Peterson wants to know who this God is or who this grand archetype or whoever what or he is but it's just unable to bridge that gap because you can't you know create and an uncreated can't bridge that gap mm-hmm. and i think that this what he's doing as you said is he's reaffirming that gap but at the same time that longing because man wants to commune with his father mm-hmm. uh, man wants to he even peterson hints at this you know rescuing your father so to speak well he's already rescued himself <laughs> he's already rescued you so to speak from the depths of hades and this is something that um it ultimately requires that i can't convey it to you i can't convey it to you through any kind of logical discourse this is the whole point of with gregory the debate between gregory and barlam mm-hmm. um but there is this leap of faith that is required I, I hate to resort to cliches like that right mm-hmm. but at, at the same time we need to be humble and if there's nothing better to say we shouldn't try to yeah. innovate too hard but but yeah so at the same time like I, I like I see what he's doing what Jordan is doing and I have a lot of respect for that I, I I'm not invalidate some people do invalidate him a bit too much 
Mm -hmm. uh, I feel they, they don't see the important place that he has. Um, I think if you're in the Orthodox camp, you see, you should be grateful that uh, God has allowed you. I shouldn't say, well, you should be grateful that you see things correctly. <laughs> no, no, no. You should be grateful that God allowed you to see things correctly because you would be no worse and maybe even far worse than the turmoil that Peterson is in now. Right. Yeah. yeah so for sure. It's for sure. like Western man trying to get back to what they've lost. And he even hints at that in the first part of his biblical lectures. He starts with this kind of grand retelling of the Western story. Mm -hmm. Um which at one point was rooted in the East, by the way, but yeah, we'll yeah. talk about that. <laughs> sure. you know. Anyway, that was another bit of rambling there, but. No, not yeah. at all. I think that that's, that's wonderful. Um, and, and something that kind of came to me when uh, we talk about, you know, know God, the father, the word mm -hmm. father in Greek is patera, right? Which is the root word of pattern, right? So know the, not just observe mm -hmm. the pattern with your eyes or understand it propositionally, and to bring in a little John Verveke, you know, you, you, you do pers perspectively participatory, right? And it's like, it's something mm -hmm. that you can, you can uh, embody and engage with. And I think that when you said leap of faith, like faith is something that you cultivate. Faith is a mode of perception, right? So to have the leap of faith is to let go of your dogmas, to let go of what you've been taught, right? And to, mm -hmm. and to make that leap. And in doing that, you cultivate new eyes to, to see Christ, to see. Yeah. And the Greek word for faith, uh, we use the word um, bisti, the faithful. The, um, and that's the word that we actually use um, for uh, the same root for epistemology, the yeah, study of knowledge, the study of knowledge itself. And so there's this inherent idea that, well, at the basis of true gnosis, of true knowledge that so many people seek is bisti, is faith. It's yeah. something that you... It's something beyond knowledge or beyond perception that jumpstarts it within yourself, within your heart. And that's yeah. an interesting implication there. That's yeah. great. It's point. Like we're trying to, we're trying to cultivate knowledge um, without faith. And that's just the, the, the problem is you do have faith. You do put your faith in something. You just don't know what it is. And the, maybe if you knew what it was, you'd be terrified, but yeah, that's but a great yeah. point that at the root of the word epistemology, right, which mm -hmm. is, you know, scientific, the, the, nat the way to observe the natural world through scientific epistemology at the root of it is faith, right, this pisti, right, and mm -hmm. we put our faith that when we use our instruments and our reason to observe the natural environment, that what shows up for us, there's a fidelity between our, you know, experiments and the results, and there's something to that that we just push a little further, right? It's like push a little further on that because I think one of the solutions, and this might be, uh, you know, kind of a grandiose thing to say, but I think one of the solutions to the problem of scientism is the uh, the re reinstantiation of faith and love in science, right? Science is is loving the beautiful natural world, which is how the God reveals Himself to to the humans, mm -hmm. right, through Scripture and through the natural world. If you don't love something, you can never understand it. Wasn't that an ethics of beauty quote? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That, that yeah. is the, uh, so love is the key there, man. And not some hippie dippy new age way, like in a very ontological, you know, rooted metaphysical way of, of, uh, loving. And again, I think it comes with the cultivation of a pure heart to be able to understand and apply that love. Like, cause you can say, Oh, you know, I told, I was told today to love everybody. So, Starting today, I'm going to love everybody. It doesn't work like that, you know? It, so, it, it, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, anyways, I think um, that's wonderful. So the, these first, the first group that we just discussed here, right, have to do with the first commandment of the two major commandments is love God with all your heart, right? To love God with all your heart. Here are the, uh, here are the codes to uh, instantiate in your life and in your relationships to do that. And then through that, right, then you have the, the second kind of chunk here right is is love your neighbor which you know in, in the postmodern psychoanalytic world there's this idea mm -hmm. of the other or the big other right um so it's love the other love your neighbor uh, as yourself and yourself is plugged into the infinite through the first portion of the, of the laws right you're mm -hmm. you know so it's like and then from there you know honor your mother honor your mother and, and your father um it, I keep looking at the, the, the lens of our world now uh, with we have a constant 
the the proliferation of divorce, the disintegration of the nuclear family, the the um, the disintegration of fathers from their families and in homes, and what that's leading, what that's doing to civilization, and you see these difficult challenges that happen in communities, uh, you know, black and brown communities or poor communities in general. You have this, and this is a conservative viewpoint that I've always heard mm -hmm. and I never really resonated. And I'm, I'm not coming at it from a conservative perspective, but if you kick the father out of the house, right, you're doing a disservice to the mother, right? And you're doing a disservice exactly. to, the, to the children and you're doing a disservice to the community, right? So all, for, all energy should be focused on suturing and repairing and remembering the family instead of what's happening now is the dissolution and the dismemberment of the nuclear family, you know, not to bring in you know, yeah. a hot topic like BLM saying we need to dis dismantle the nuclear family where look at the results of what's happening in our communities when we do that. It doesn't have to be spiritual or anything. Look at the results from what we've been doing. So I think that's a, that's a big one, too. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on uh, how do we square honor your father, your father and your mother with, you know, uh, leave your family, leave your father and your mother if you don't, you know, don't love them. I forgot exactly well, how it was, but if you frame if you frame all this as one way you can look at all this is it is a, a cosmic liturgical injunction like you need to keep the cosmos balanced within yourself and everything else around you right uh, and one of the ways that you do it is this um and this there's so many things that tie into this uh fifth commandment here but um honoring your father and your mother well first of all this is this is this hints at a kind of symbolism if you compare the first of the uh, commandments for your neighbor and the first of the commandments to God, there's uh, an analogy there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that hints at the whole purpose of this uh, commandment is that you're not necessarily, you don't show your father and your mother honor because they deserve it uh, in a way. Well, they do deserve it because they God used them to bring you into being. So you will always be bound for that. You will never fully repay what they, what God has done um for you through them yeah. right so in, in in a sense they will always deserve it um but uh honoring them i had this for, forgive me i had something in my on my mind right now yeah uh, train of thought but my um it's just honoring them keeps this whole cosmos from falling apart basically it goes back to what you were saying is that well i mean even just elsewhere if you've ever angered your father or your mother, and we, we've all had this, you ever had this joy when you could just, you, you notice this twisted and demented joy. It's not real joy. It's, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but uh, uh, euphoria, demonic euphoria that you get from dishonoring them or pointing out their flaws that they themselves know, man, I should have fixed this how mm -hmm. many decades ago, but mm -hmm. I'm going to point this out on you and I'm going to criticize you. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to play this mini kind of like Zeus Cronus role where I'm going to upthrow mm -hmm. my father and become the head of this universe and, and all that. And it's this twisted story that the, even the ancients knew about, but there's something, there's something unsettling about that because even if what you said was correct, but the fact of the matter, rather, if the fact of the matter was correct, there's something about that, that stains your own soul and stains the world around you yeah and it's it's something that you will never it reminds me of uh sirach where the wisdom of sirach where he says uh be patient with your father in his old age you know the dishonor of your father is no honor to you mm -hmm. and i'm like means that he's seen this uh he's i i call him jesus even though he's not mexican um <laughs> My, that's right. Jesus, one of the, the best writers in the Old Testament, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a I fun think, thing. But yeah, he's yeah. seen that happen all the time, rather, I should say. And that's um, uh, there's something spoiling about that. I mean, you could say some soiling the I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to hint at this correctly, but I don't have the wording for it right now. I think uh, just uh, I think let's see if this lands. It's a recapitulation of the fall. Right. Exactly. This, 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 that's, a, that's another way this, to put it. This, that's, I mean, that's what came to mind is this rebellious spirit that was mm -hmm. instantiated from the fall. Like, you know, there's, uh, I think there's a, not a joy. See, yeah, it's, it's hard to come up the word like, like a schadenfreude, uh, you know, not even a schadenfreude. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What is that, the, the uh, joy or the value that you get from, um, from pointing that out? High. 
that yeah, weird kind of high. Yeah. Maybe somebody can help us out if, uh, you know, when, when we post this of what, what is the word there of, uh, of, yeah, you know, of taking real, I don't know. It's a weird kind of, yeah. Yeah. Of being thrilled mm. by dishonoring, uh, your parents. So, so again, right here, here are the rules, right. Recapitulating. Uh, and I think, does that, you think that resonates with, uh, the first commandment, you know, have no other gods besides me or, you know, I think it recapitulates a lot of those, right. Cause don't misuse the name of the Lord, your God. Right. Um, so to honor your father your father and your mother, Something it's an extension. Uh, it seems to be, I mean, it says elsewhere, if you break one commandment, you break all the commandments. So then that implies that they're, they're all bound up to each uh, with each other yeah. in mystical ways like that. But I think it also applies, well, not just to your own parents, but even uh, your father and your mother, of course, being your own culture, your own cultural upbringing. Yeah. Because in, in, in a sense, that has... Um, we even call it in Greek. We have the word like, um, well, we use it in English too, like "ipatrida," like our, our, uh, your, your, your fatherland, it's right? So there's this idea, right? Yeah. There's yeah. this idea, right? There's this idea of fatherhood that's implied to the land, the land that God gave you to to dwell in and to respect. You see that in elsewhere in the Old Testament, God providing land for your descendants to inherit, particularly yeah. the Abrahamic covenant. But that's yeah. and, and there's this uh, very, you know, the Greeks mm -hmm. have a very <laughs> poignant cur like curses you know you know like i'm trying to explain yeah. it to my american friend i'm like that means you know f your entire lineage not just you and your mm -hmm. family like your soy your essence <laughs> um yeah it, uh, so kind of one more thing i think here is is in in the ethics of beauty uh dr patizas talks about the naming of mm -hmm. your children as your father and your mother right is mm -hmm. a way of honoring them right and it's a way of when you are taking care of your young children, you that you name your mother and your father, you gain insight into the difficulties that they had as parents, right? Mm -hmm. So it heals that relationship up, right? By by suturing, by you know, by manifesting the relationship down between the father and the, and the kids, or the parents and the kids, gives insight to the relationship between your parents, and then naming them reminds you of the struggles that they had, and it kind of heals it it heals the relationship there. This is, this is um, when you talk about the recapitulation of the fall, this is something that I noticed with uh, the idea of covering the nakedness of your father. I know Jonathan mm -hmm. talks about that. Jordan talked about that at one point. Uh, of course, we're constantly pushed to upend and expose our history and our father. And I'm sympathetic with some of what the points as well. I mean, you can criticize your nation all you want and you might again you might be correct but there's an idea that it's like it's like god is telling you like put a stop put up put the brakes on this dissolution of reality because yeah you live in a world that's mired with the ancestral sin there's this proclivity now towards de deliturgizing de, de, uh, de towards complete destruction of of everything right it's transforming being into into the same not like father seraphim rose calls it being wants to fall back into the nothingness the scoton that mm -hmm. um god created everything out of he created it from nothing and now being wants to become back wants to go back to that nothing yeah. and so there's this there's this push that we have and there's this weird i mean paul talks about it like that i want i that i will to do i don't do that i will not to do i do right he yeah. sees that and it's like, what the, what the hell, literally, what the hell is wrong with me? Why do I have this craving to waste my life? Why do I, why do I hate the things of my God? Why do I not go to church? Why do I not pray? Why do I have this yearning to destroy this beautiful creation that my father gave me? And there's this tendency that we have. And this is the presence of the fall within mm -hmm. you that Christ came to heal through mm -hmm. his sacraments, through um, destroying death, right? Uh, by by choosing to become incarnate and letting his lineage his soy uh according to uh his flesh rather right the the line of david allowing them to dishonor him and this again hints at the mystery of christ i mean he he is the father of everything he allows his children to dishonor him in the worst way and through that he offers himself up for the whole cosmos to be healed right so yeah i think that's very interesting and then uh you did talk about um You've been focusing recently on the Panagia. Mm -hmm. um, this most definitely refers to her and what she embodies as the church herself, the church as our mother. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I don't know. I do get quite scatterbrained, so forgive me on that. No, we're not. Uh, we're not coming to this talk with prepackaged mm-hmm. ideas, you know, that we're trying to argue. Um, at mm-hmm. least I don't think you are, and I'm not. I think we're struggling to mm-hmm. put words yeah. to these ideas as we're engaging here. You know, we we didn't plan this. You know, mm-hmm. two hours ago we were like, you know, I reached out and and you agreed, and I'm very grateful. Um, I think quick, maybe the last thing on this is, uh, and I can't explain it really, because, uh, you know, in Dr. Petitsis talks about this idea of gender in, in the orthodox idea of gender mm-hmm. through marriage, how uh, each, each member, right? So the husband and the wife, they take three roles. They have three, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, offices. Designations, that they hold. yeah. Mm-hmm. Offices, the office of the, of the king, the office of the priest, and the office of the prophet right? These Mm -hmm. three offices we hold and they invert, they, uh, you know, at first the husband takes the role of the king who goes out and faces the world, right? And, and brings home, you know, the, the riches in a sense, right? And the wife takes the role of the prophet who faces inward, right? Facing the children and providing the care and protection, uh, in the home, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then through the, their priestly role, they sacrifice their roles. So the, the, the kingly role and the prophet prophetic role are sacrificed and they actually invert. So later on, uh, as, as, uh, if it's done in this self-sacrificial love, the wife takes the role of a protector, right? You can think of her, you know, taking her cloak or her robe and putting it over the family. Like you can think of uh, Panagia being over Mount Athos, right? Like there's not, yeah. Yeah. So, and then then, the icon of her and the husband takes the role of the prophet and is more inward Mm -hmm. facing. So it's this, this inversion of the genders that through Christ leads to a union with, with God in a sense. Now I, I butchered the explanation there, but um, something that stuck, you know, when I read that, I've been wrestling with it for the last few months. Uh, and it's just, it's very relevant to what's happening right now with mm-hmm. the, the insanity, with the, the gender uh, proliferation of pronouns and whatever that may be. But um, you know, yeah. we, we don't need to get into And that. it's, it's this, it's this recognition of a lack that you have, because again, it's important to remember that, uh, again, one of my favorite saints, John of Damascus, in his exposition of the Orthodox faith, he talks about how the idea of gender was not actually part of God's primary will. So he makes a distinction between the primary will of God and the secondary will of God, or his concessive will. Mm-hmm. And the secondary or the concessive will is um, in view of our blundering, in view of our ancestral sin, has put in place this... Um, means this the structure in reality that allows us um as a law to then come back up uh, and reconcile yourself to god right Mm -hmm. and one of these aspects of his secondary will was in fact gender right Mm -hmm. the reason why god um the reason why god made the male and female wasn't because he had wanted them to be male and female he made the male and female because he knew that they would fall Mm -hmm. and that they would need to reproduce sexually and carnally that they would need this designation of roles that you've laid out in order to allow this, not only the survival, there is a practical element of it, right? We talk about that where um, there's the, just the practicality of a, of, of a mother providing and staying home for her children. And of course, the husband going out. So there's that, but it, it goes a lot more deeper than that, mm-hmm. right? But, and I think that what these people, and this is something I thought about too, the people who try to do away with gender, um, who try to view it as a purely social construct and all that, they're they're wrong in a physical sense because it's a fact of biology and God declared it this way. So you're wrong on that sense, but I can sympathize with the yearnings that you have to go beyond these because mm-hmm. in Christ, these boundaries become dis- dissolved, right? They become completely done away with in the eschaton in the new creation, right? Yeah. Uh, we see, we hint at this in the new Testament, right? And even the whole point of the genders are for them to be, like you said, to, for them to be um, reconciled and, um, we yearn through each other, right? So yeah. uh, I can sympathize with this yearning to do away with this restriction or this um, this curse that you have, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Because we're after the fall, both Adam and Eve received various uh, uh, curses upon themselves that they had to carry out uh, toward their death, right? The man having to uh, struggle by the sweat of his brow to survive, the woman to be com- um, completely obedient to her husband, that's the type of a curse. Mm-hmm. And, but through and in Christ, he takes these curses and he shows them that behind them all is actually a means for, uh, uh, uh resurrection. Yeah. Reconciliation. 
And so I think yeah. this is what these people, um, what they yearn for when they recognize the the ickiness or so to speak, or something wrong with being uh, classed in these two genders. But uh, if you stick if you stick with what you have or what you've been given and you work through it, you'll realize that there's uh, something beautiful in that. Right. So yeah. like learning, learning to be more feminine as a man, of course, not becoming like, you know, soy faced yeah, type not, not un unmanliness. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not but effeminate. learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But feminine. Yeah. So I think that, yeah. that, that speaks to that. And, you know, it just came to mind is this, yeah, like we were saying earlier that um, all everybody intuits the patterns, right. The pattern yeah. of, what's wrong with me as a, in, in terms of a gender, right? This, this yeah. community, these are our brothers and sisters, right? Like that, that are having these, you know, horrible, um, you know, dysphoric feelings about their gender. Right. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the, you know, it's this, what's missing is the self sacrificial love of Christ, right. Of sacrificing that gender for the other, you know, like it has to be, you know, they're, it's inverted and they're looking to sacrifice society or sacrifice the other for my identity to be made manifest, right? Like this is my identity. And it's not even, it's not embedded in a community or a network of relationships. It's just an identity that is just plucked out. Right. And then it's, yeah, it is like a virus. We it, need to recognize yeah. my identity. So it's the app. It's, mm. it's the antichrist in the sense that it's the, it's gender instead of Christ. It's this reversing of mm. the genders without the self-sacrifice a love of Christ in a sense. Yeah. 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 And it, it is like, I mean, I was, when the whole COVID thing came out, I was contemplating the implications of, of viral, uh, viral encoding or viral DNA, which is incomplete and mm -hmm. in the liturgical, it cannot reproduce itself. It cannot, it cannot cohere with multiple copies of itself. It has to infect a host and uh, destroy or decouple that host's integrity. And I think that this is, um, and Jordan Peterson talks about ideologies that way too, as fragment. You see, I love Jordan. I know you guys, if you come out of this and you say, well, I would be completely mean to Jordan. I did take a lot from his ideas. So don't worry. I mean, I have respect <laughs> for him. So he even talks about ideologies as like these fragmentary paradigms that people hold on to. And yeah, so that's an interesting thing too. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. That was the fifth commandment. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. That was, that was a trigger point. <laughs> That's the one we were just going to cover real quick too. We spent kind of the most time on it. Um, yeah. So I guess let's move along. Uh, uh, yeah, we might as well. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, next is do not commit adultery. Uh, right. And again, I think that speaks to, uh, you know, keep the integrity of, of the identity of the relationship that is mm -hmm. marriage. Right. That if when a when divorce happens, something dies. Right. It's a yeah. body in terms of the, the Orthodox or the Christian perspective, when one, when two are married, when you are married, you become one flesh, you become metaphysically something higher. And then, you know, when a divorce happens, something dies. And I don't know if it was father uh, De Young that was talking about, you can have parents that wholeheartedly love their children. And then when the divorce happens, they still wholeheartedly love their children, but that love between the parents, right, is not there growing and nurturing and supporting the children. So there's a, a break that happens, an ontological break that happens that has a, an impact, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think so in terms of do not commit adultery, don't, don't uh, you know, do not go outside the bounds of your marriage and do not violate the integrity and identity of another relationship that is one, in a sense. And later when we get to the Beatitudes, he talks about uh, mm -hmm. it's not it's not um, it's not enough just to not sleep with another man's wife. It's to not think about it. Right. Which is like, whoa, what do you mean? Don't think about it. Well, it's because, you know, you're looking to build the kingdom of heaven. Right. Your thoughts mm -hmm. are, you know, they have they have ontological and metaphysical effects. And most of your thoughts, you know, are not yours in a sense, uh, you know, but I don't want to yeah. go, kind of go on, on that tangent here. So what do you think in terms of uh, yeah. commit adultery? Well, I kind of reiterate what I talked about, how the fifth and, uh, or rather commandments five through 10 mirror commandments one through four um, on a more mundane way, right? So you have, for example, honor your father and your mother that mimics have no other gods besides me. So there's this fidelity towards, um, your your origin your your earthly soy and your heavenly soy so to speak <laughs> do not commit adultery that most certainly has something to do um with idolatry mm -hmm. like what you choose and oftentimes if you read um throughout the the prophets right in the old testament 
uh, one of the, the images that the prophets constantly hearken back to is the idea of fidelity, of, of a man being unfaithful to his wife, mm-hmm. right? And that's how Israel has committed fornication with me, with other gods, right? Has um, committed adultery with other, uh, with, uh, with other gods, right? And you see it even to an excessive uh, extreme in Ezekiel, where they describe Judah and Israel as, as two sluty sisters, if I had to use a different word. And it gets really graphic um, yeah. regarding that. And you see, again, I like to always point this to, to Christ, is that Christ, in choosing to become incarnate in Rome, and then eventually deifying the Roman Empire into the Romeocini, into um, the longest lasting you know, empire in history, in a sense, he committed adultery with this, this harlot, this being, or, or not him, I shouldn't say that, forgive me, but he, this being rather who, um, who committed fornication with the surrounding nations, right? Mm-hmm. He joined himself to her, right? to, and I know Jonathan talked about that recently in the talk with Ethiopia and, uh, and Richard and all that, they hinted at this where even underlying this, there's this, there's this flip that occurs where the uh, the connection, so to speak, or the overspread reach of the adulterer is then used to bring about uh, this liturgical union l- later on, right? So mm-hmm. I, I I forget where um, I, b- I believe I read Saint John Chrysostom. He said something along the lines of uh, I don't I can't I don't have the reference on top of me, but Christ is married to a whore, <laughs> and he said that in reference to us. I mean, how unfaithful are we? Mm. Uh, we call ourselves Christian, and yet we slip all the time, and we fornicate with all these dissenting logis me these thoughts and we let them we 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 let them birth inside of us in the same way that um an adulterous woman never refuses a union with a man right so it's adultery i like to think of adultery at uh, the the deeper levels of adultery not just between a father and a mother or the more um obvious effects that it has uh through children that's all uh, well and good but that, that that was something that came to me as well, but there's this, there's this sense of consistency where, I mean, Christ is constantly calling out hypocrisy in the new Testament, uh, yeah. especially with, um, keeping, you keep your outward parts clean, but your inward parts, you, you do not, yeah, um, I, I paraphrasing think, there too, but yeah. Just to, to touch on that a bit. So is it the same word in, in terms of like, uh, adultery in terms of like, you keep things pure, right? You don't add, um, you don't add extraneous, it reminds me of this, um, uh, you know, this hybrid idea of hybridity, right? If you yeah. adulter something, you know, you're, you're actually, uh, you're you know, committing a sin, obviously. Another thing quickly, I guess, uh, is when you said do not, it, it resonates and it reflects, do not make for yourself an idol, because when you are sleeping with uh, another man's wife, mm-hmm. it's not the wife that is in your head, right? It's this idea of this person right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time it doesn't work out, obviously, but you're actually creating an idol by sleeping with another man's wife because you're projecting this desirous, Mm -hmm. you know, woman creature, right? In a sense, and you're investing your desire in the idea of sleeping with her. And then when you do it, it it crumbles most of the time. Yeah. So yeah, I like how you're reflecting them, uh, them with each other. I think, you know, I don't know if it's, it's hitting mm-hmm. a little bit, so the the analogies might be a little strenuous strenuous here and there, but um, you know. It's but it's like the purity laws of keeping the hierarchy focused, right? There's yeah. the uh, remembrance of the father and the mother, that the one that you have, the remembrance of your God. I mean, there's this idea that there were these temptations, uh, constant temptations to fall aside and go astray, to do what was uh, what was prevalent or what was um, what was ex- what was exciting, right? So to speak, you see this in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 34 with Dinah, and it's implied that she went astray from her family uh, all alone, and her the territory prince Shechem lying with her, causing the uh, it, it signified the idea of some kind of fornicated union. It didn't say it exactly in the Septuagint, but it hinted at it. This led ultimately to the death of hundreds of men. After this, you know, to keep the honor of uh, their uh, the, their sister pure, in that sense, after they defiled it, right, uh, having to bring about retribution. So this does have this does um, 
point to that as well, like this uh, relationship that you have with other people, not necessarily the damage that it will do to you and your own family, but what, what will that, uh, how would that solely the integrity of other little communities as well? Like if someone you know was violated in this way, how that affects more than just that person and mm -hmm. her relatives, right? That, or his, uh, but yeah. mostly her, right? Yeah, because it has a fractal effect up and down the hierarchy, <clears throat> right? So yeah, and that's that's one of the ways that you know when when you took when you took war uh, criminals, you would um, sleep with their wives and daughters. That was the best way if you wanted to sully their uh, image, mm -hmm. right? And, and and people knew this, right? Yeah, you know, a lot of uh, uh, reflections are coming from the uh, the beatitudes right now, and and mm -hmm. talking through this, and you know. Um, I guess we understand like, so do not steal and do not kill the, both of those are, are related to, you know, um, and don't keeping the identity and the integrity of the hierarchy, right? If you yep. you're just at the civilizational level, if you steal as a rule, then um, civilization will not manifest or if you kill, right. And then later on, it becomes don't even have thoughts of killing or thoughts of stealing in a sense. So it's, it, it's taking this to a higher spiritual level, right? It's getting closer to the idea of what Adam and Eve were originally supposed to do and understand and before they fell so they could build the kingdom of heaven on earth right there now we're trying to continuously eat from the tree and build the civilization and build the kingdom we keep falling and these there's very simple rules here very simple to i guess articulate and understand that if followed you know we'll take you to that uh we'll take you to that next level in, in civilization building uh and just i also think i think about do not steal and do not kill together i'm reminded of cain uh, because Cain, his name, uh, I, I, I believe it means to acquire or to get. Because I think it says, um, uh, if you look at Genesis 3, I'm trying to remember exactly, but uh, it qu quotes Eve. And Eve says, I will name him Cain I have, because I have gotten a man from the Lord and gotten to acquire. Mm -hmm. And that is integral to his identity. He tills the ground. He tills the earth. And because he failed to... He failed to keep the door of his heart pure from this temptation. He killed his brother. He took um, he took his brother's life, one of the ultimate abomination, and then that led to the building of civilization. I mean, Saint Augustine talks about that in um, the parallel. I mean, this is the city of God, right? How the city of man, how Cain built the names of the city of man mim mimic the names of the city of God, right? So there's mm -hmm. this ultimate. You start seeing this progressive fall. Uh, and I think that these two commandments, they do, they, they do harken back, do not acquire and do not, uh, do not, I mean, when you kill, you're, you're taking someone's whole personhood apart, right? Mm -hmm. And all yeah. that. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and just to maybe give a hint, I'd love to have a part two with you of getting into to the Beatitudes, which, uh, you know, um, the first one is, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven right the kingdom of god what is uh, what do you mean blessed are the poor in spirit and this distinction that um was made of the spirit think of it in the hegelian terms of geist right zeitgeist mm -hmm. the spirit of the time the spirit of the age mm -hmm. so blessed are the poor in the spirit of the age blessed are those that don't aren't puffed up in the way the world is now right that, that don't give in to the vicissitudes of the yeah. fall which is manifestation in, in civilization so blessed are, are those poor in spirit, right? And this idea of the fallen spirit, this idea of, of the civilization that is civilizations that continue to get built under the under Cain, right? Don't participate, mm. right? Be in the world and not of it. Do not be within the spirit of the world, right? Be poor in that spirit. And then you will, you know, carry the torch through to the kingdom of heaven. Because if you are poor mm -hmm. in that spirit, right? And you have, you know, and you're working on uh you know, it, it metanoia and you're working through uh, prayer and, and repentance and, and through the sacraments that will infect, that's probably a terrible word, others that, to be poor in the spirit. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, being in, it the is ark. in that way. Yeah. It's being in the ark and being through these, these tumultuous times as the winds and the vicissitudes blow, right. You're not participating in that. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's what, that was a profound insight there that that um augustine i think touched upon it is that what, what does it mean to blessed are the poor in spirit for they will inherit the kingdom of, of heaven um so i think that's a little uh maybe teaser into part two when we get into the the, the beatitudes because there's a bunch of those uh you know 
kind of really beautiful things that I'd love to get into with you, but let's round it out here. And man, I, I could go for another hour. I have to pick yeah. up my kids like at that six, it's five twenty three now, but they're like, 10 oh, minutes away. so we should be. Yeah. 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 But I want, I want to get through this with you here. Um, so uh, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And I think, and now I think going through them, it becomes uh, uh, obvious of how they reflect with each other and what they're doing. I think is that, does that sense you get as well? Yeah. Um, I think now it tends to, again, I go back to how do these reflect the first bunch of commandments we have, do not carry or do not take the name of the Lord, your God in vain, do not misuse it. And I think um, do not bear false witness against your neighbor does reflect that in a sense, because your neighbor, other persons are fellow uh, fe fellow gods, so to speak, potential gods, fellow potential saints, right? And you're not yeah. to, you're not to solely that. You're not to. Uh, it's it's a reminder of the inherent dignity that the person uh, next to you has. I mean, now that you know not to slam, now that you know not to kill them, not to sleep with their their loved ones, uh, not to take their possessions. Right? Again, I'm not. I'm not trying to be too um, jovial here because this was a very primitive time and they needed to they needed this reinforcement yeah yeah but sure. it's this it's this it's this reminder that well there's dignity in this fellow person and that you um we do take that for granted nowadays like why should i and especially when you see children or people who grew up in very unstable homes and communities this just doesn't seem to register to them because it's always about the way that a lot of these people act as well, I'm going to live in the best way that suits me. It's a will to power Nietzschean type position. So look, man, I got to do what I got to do to get what's mine and get what to survive. And this is just how it is. And I think about that and I say, wow, how can you, I feel sorry for you if you really view things that way and you don't understand that there's the dignity that's within the, um, the fellow man. And I think to cap off my saying here i'm reminded again of saint Paisios's um use of philotimo it's like you you have this love or you look at for example your parents or the people around you who've done something for you even those who haven't necessarily done something for you but there's this unexpl un un unexpressible virtue that demands your i would say your unspoken allegiance and respect towards other people, if I had to express it that way. And I think that does hint at that as well. Like it, I think Philotimo can be classed under the ninth commandment, so to speak. Yeah, I think great point. And I think Philotimo is the bridge between the kingdoms, right? Yeah. It's hard to, to translate that word, uh, but it's like, you know, the magnanimity or love of honor, mm -hmm. but it's respecting the dignity of the other right and well in in a well-wishing way like you know mm -hmm. you can think of it in terms like peterson again talks about you know a love that does not seek its own yeah it, it, re, re, surround yourself with people that are genuinely happy when you see, have successes in life right yep. and you should be genuinely happy and want to help people that are doing well and when they're when they do well right don't feel guilty or jealous or resentment right that guilt that jealous and that resentment uh, eats away at the civilization in a sense, right? So I, th I think Philotimo is an inversion of that, right? I think it's this, uh, it's the bridge where we need to be, where we need to get, uh, to get to the Beatitudes, to get to be able to at least uh, get a foothold in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and I think what you were saying before, um, you know, um, when you were saying that, you know, people that, you know, I'm living my best life and Yas Queen and, you know, the whole thing, <laughs> like that exactly. is participating in the spirit of the age, right? So blessed are those poor in spirit, right? Blessed are those that are poor, that are poor in the investment of their desire into the mimetic rivalry and, to, and, and what came to mind also when you were uh, talking about that um, is don't violate in terms of dignity, don't violate the sovereignty of others, of the other people. They have an identity that is hallowed like you, right? They have a sovereignty they deserve respect and and dignity and right now we're you know especially in, in in our country in america like we're the people that are well aware have historically been well aware of the othering of of, of a people or of a community are now othering you know uh like let's say the republicans as a whole or trump supporters it's like you know what i'm saying so it's like the people that are very keenly aware of of 
not to other people and what the manifestations and consequences of doing that are, are doing it. Like, it's like, Oh mm -hmm. my, you know, they know not what they do, but I think this idea of sovereignty came to mind um, when you were reflecting there on this, uh, on this particular commandment. Um, mm -hmm. And it and also, also what came to mind is, you know, like do not gossip, right? Wow. Why would mm, God that's care? An, oh, I hate gossip. So I don't get me started on gossip. I Why would it. God care if you gossip? You oh. have, you believe in a God, Pano, that cares if you gossip, like, come on, there's so many things in this world, but the idea is like, you know, if you gossip, if you talk bad behind people's backs, that has an ontological and a metaphysical effect on yourself, your family, and your community, right? You see, yeah. it manifest. you don't have to believe this, like as some kind of moral platitude, you see it happen in office politics. Like if you work in the office, uh, kind of uh, I've worked in the office uh, space, like the office space is a good movie that, that makes fun of, uh, uh, you know, that, that, you know, uses humor to point at the, uh, the ridiculousness of office politics. And you see shows like, uh, you know, the real housewives of, you know, New Jersey or whatever you see, like the, the way that they live life is there in, in this is not. So from the, these weird, like rituals that spring up in, the cities of Cain, so to speak, that people yeah. feel beholden to. It's like, why do I feel the need to, why should I respect? So like in particular, we, we, we know this with our own people, with a lot of Greek people where they'll treat the gossiping uh, rituals more important than the liturgy and the Eucharist itself. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're considered a wimp or a loser. You just don't get it, man. You just got to kind of fall like, no, I get what you guys are doing yeah. and it's destructive and it's stupid and it's stressful and it's stupid. Like, it's I, I don't want to participate. It's, it's yeah. easy to get pulled into it without being aware yeah. of it. It's easy. And it's, just... and that's the thing that like, when you just point out there, there's a limit to it. I think when you get into small talk, everyone you should be able to engage in some levels of small talk. Um, and there are those who completely hate small talk. And I yeah. personally would avoid it if I could, but yeah. <laughs> there's just some of it that we have to give sway to, but yeah, it's these weird gestures that um, rituals that form that have no weight or, context within themselves and they ultimately lead to slandering the other person they, and they thrive off of that even comedy for example mm -hmm. most of comedy is just how can we get a laugh at this person's expense yeah right and it's yeah. i think that does fall into that too and the people that are very well off financially and wealth wise right they fall into this uh you know like you said ritualistic uh constant gossiping and talking about others and, and i mean you know and, and when you get later into the the beatitudes right is this so uh, how do we up level this or, you know, transfigure this idea of, mm -hmm. of gossip and do not bear false witness against your neighbor is the idea of the speck in the log in the eye, right? Yep. It's like, you know, if you have a log in your own eye, don't talk about the speck in your brother's eye and don't try to take the log out of your brother's eye until you take it out of your eye. So it's this idea of, of uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the, the meta, the meta law as, as in terms of do, do not bear false witness, right? Then, do not talk about negatively or point out the flaws in, in others, which, you know, we all do all the time in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Cause we obviously we don't live in the kingdom, but, you know, have, being aware of, of the significance of that idea, uh, you know, putting it in your consciousness and in your heart, you know, it'll show up for you when you're doing it either before or after you commit this type of, you know, what seems like a little sin, right. Is gossiping or, or, you know, telling little white lies, you know, these little white lies, have a well, again you're 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 mimicking satan in the garden of eden he says well ye shall not surely die mm -hmm. you know the lord knows that in the day you eat thereof you will become like gods and so he's twisting theosis right there in the ear yeah. of eve right like and death, so when you yeah. gossip when you gossip you're sowing seeds of dissent that ultimately collapse reality and, and we see jokes i'm thinking of shakespeare much ado about nothing which one of my favorite of his comedies and the whole play is just about rumors and gossips and misunderstandings spreading and culminating to ever greater levels of uh comedy and hysteria that ultimately lead to this blow up at the end and then when people realize why they were fighting it's like well, why are we fighting i don't get it There's and no it started from this yeah and it's shakespeare was using that as a way to first comedy but i think it is a, a, a nice uh uh, commentary on that commandment in, in a way yeah great point because most of the um most of the conflict between neighbors and friends and families and, mm -hmm. and husbands and wives uh this this idea this phrase came to mind there's no there there right like when you try to pinpoint what's the actual grievance here like there's this is happening in my my neighborhood right now we have a great neighborhood and, and families five or six families that 
I've been real close over the years. And then since the coronavirus happened, there's been a break between the two sides. And like, I still hang, you know, there's one of um, my neighbor and I, like we keep it like, there's no animosity there, but there's all this animosity we built and there's no there there. Like someone felt mm -hmm. slighted because of someone said this, that, and the other. I'm like, but there's nothing there. Like we have, you like, you know what I'm saying? So these little white lies, like death by a thousand cuts, these things that seem insignificant, little gossip, and if, little white lies. If, like if, if, if it was important, if there was something there, if there was something important, you would remember it and you should discuss it. But be, the fact that people can't identify with the issue is it really is a ground for this wasted effort. I feel, you know, and that, and that, that builds itself up to being one of the fundamental reasons of divorce, right? Like this idea that, you know, really? uh, my wife is cheating on me, right? Is, is an insecurity that you have, uh, you know, let's say there's an insecurity there. By having that insecurity, that can manifest in the relationship by your wife actually cheating on you in a sense, right? Mm. Or when you're having little fights, right, uh, that seem insignificant, a lot of times there are underlying issues that haven't been communicated or discussed. But mm -hmm. they get rooted and they get they recede in the background and then you just start fighting over you know you see couples fight over the the smallest things and it's like you know what I'm saying so it's like it builds on each other and, and it fractally leads to the disintegration of the relationship between husband and wife boyfriend and girlfriend uh, but then through the neighbors people at work and then ultimately it scales up to a country right if if this is the the underpinnings of of uh, the civilization that you're building. Um, it will lead to destruction in a sense, but it's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's good guys that you're talking about. Don't, you know, don't gossip and, and don't, you know, this next one here, uh, I get, let's get into it here and close it out. Like mm -hmm. do not covet, do not covet your neighbor's well, things. Do that ties covet. everything together, right? Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, it, it no, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say this, I think th this, I, I remember hearing from it somewhere, the 10th commandment summarizes all of the 10 in a lot of ways, because it's, um, I think all the 10 can be reflected in do not covet or do not, do not feel, what's the word I'm looking for? Do not feel negligent or do not feel um, jealous. Do not, do not feel jealous. Do not feel as if you are lacking in something uh, in particular, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not for, it, and it, so it, it's it's because yeah. you have everything with your God and with everything he's blessed you with. You have everything mm -hmm. um, you are endowed with his image and you have everything you need to become like him, to become a, a, a little God, so to speak. And <laughs> like we have in Greek, Dialothes. Dialothes. Thank you so yeah, much. What else do you need? But here's a so, yeah, I understand that, Pano. Like, I, I get it. I, I you know, I'm not very aware of the blessings in my life. I have a wonderful family and, but I'm still jealous of my, my neighbor gets a new car. I need to get a new car. My neighbor gets a new fence. I need to get a new fence. Like, how do you, how do you destroy the jealousy that's inherently there when you know that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't covet your neighbor's things. It's one thing to do it and become aware, unaware of it. Like most, I think most of people are unaware that they do it, but then even when you become aware that you do it, it's like, where do you get the willpower to overcome the jealousy, the resentment, that is so ingrained in you through the society that you're embedded in, which is doing it all the time and reflecting it back on you through television and media. I mean, this is what, this is what I think this is the 10th commandment doesn't encapsulate the word um, of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. right? The giving of thanks for everything that God has provided you with, um, you know, the body. I mean, and that's the whole liturgy and all our prayers are structured in this means of remembrance of, remembering the good the bad i mean i'm trying to quote the liturgy now uh uh calling to remembrance everything the assumption the resurrection the burial and the death on the third day your second and glorious coming and it's listing off everything in his economia everything he's done for our salvation in terms of healing our our, our human nature and then there's everything else that he's provided us with in the greater vicinity right and um and there's a section in the liturgy where we can substitute names of our of um, our hierarchs and our uh, grievances that are personal to us, right? So there is this, there is this idea of just being thankful and remembering everything that you have, and just resituating yourself in reality, because things could always be worse, and yeah, things can be better, and that's what the fact that you recognize that things can be better. I think that's what you're called here to um, to enact or to fulfill.
Yeah. But that first requires a recognition of where you are and where, uh, and the state of things as, as they may be. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Jonathan Peugeot has really brought to light for me. And I think for a lot of people of uh, the ritualistic nature of reality as such, right? So, mm -hmm. it, you know, building rituals that bring in the remembrance of the thankfulness that is your dispensation and set by going to church, setting aside time to pray. These are not empty rituals to do. These are very metaphysically real and nurturing things to do that will, that will heal relationships. And then I think like you were saying that will lead to the ability to not be jealous. Like you can know it propositionally. I shouldn't be jealous of my neighbor's things, but, yep. um, or, you know, propositionally that you should be happy when other people do well, where does this feeling come from that makes me jealous or that makes me uh, envious when something good happens to somebody that I love really very much in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. Asking that question and then, you know, building the appropriate rituals through a tradition, like, you know, there's a lot, man, we can get into there. Um, yeah. And there's a lot with regards to this uh, commandment that Rene Girard really, really uh, distills with his mimetic rivalry, right? That this mm -hmm. commandment leads to, you know, uh, we human desires is the big thing treated by Girard and by the psychoanalysts. Like, what is desire? So he, Girard says that your desire is always desire of the other or what the other desires. So you don't want the, the Nike Jordans inherently because of the quality of the Jordans. You want the Jordans because other people want it. You know, you, this girl that you, that likes you, right. That you don't really like that much, but when your friend starts liking her, right. Oh, you know, you like this girl in a sense, right. So our desire is channeled through the mm -hmm. other in a sense. So that leads eventually that leads to rivalry, right. You have a friend, a best friend, a mentor that eventually through this mimetic process, which is encapsulated in the, in this 10th commandment that eventually leads to a stumbling block in the relationship. And it leads to the disintegration of the relationship. And that happens at the individual level, at the familial level, the corporate level, and so forth, right? So well, by your own desires, you are led astray. And according to Apostle James, right in the his epistle of James, he talks about how well, the source of all strife and troubles and turmoil in this world is your own desires, right? It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, Adam and Adam and Eve did not fall because of the serpent. Adam and Eve fell because of their own desires that the serpents ex, the serpent exploited. So and desire I think that, is powerful. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Just saying like, yeah, no, like, like came to mind here. Yeah. The 10th commandment, I think also encapsulates the whole hesychastic life, the spiritual tradition that we have, which is to rise above the mere whims, the logis me that are constantly assaulting us, right. From uh, noetic beings, from even our own desires is to rise above all this and to just no, just fully and clearly apprehend what's in front of your reality as it is. And I think that those sort of, again, to go back to the mirroring, how do the commandments mirror? How do the latter commandments mirror the former ones? Do not covet does seem to be a kind of a Sabbath where you are, you are in this tranquility of, of uh, place and time, like the sense that, well, I'm, pl I'm placed here for a reason. I, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to exist. God allowed me to live this far for a purpose. And it is my job to, fulfill that you know we call that your your own logi your own kind of inherent destiny that you were that was sort of uh your your own telos that was spoken into you so it's remembrance of all these things and kind of where you've been where you are where you're going and how that is reflected in uh, your, your relationship with god with the people around you and also the idea that all of your people's uh, destinies in a way are bound together. I mean, we're all working on like the meaning crisis, for example, we're all going through all this and we're trying to figure out, well, where did we go astray? Um, how can we reconcile all that? Right. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot and it, it does foment this um, neo uh, communities or these new liturgies that, that are happening. I would never have met you. I would never have met so many other people Mm -hmm. uh, if it wasn't for this uh, trouble, this problem that was put before us, one through um, and, and initially through the meaning problems that we had and now spiraling out even further. Um, yeah. So it, it, it at one way it's dissolving, but at the same time, it's allowing something new um, to come out. So 
I yeah. think um, I, I don't know how exactly that ties into do not covet, but I thought no, it was wonderful. useful. <laughs> I, think, I think you buttoned up the whole, uh, you know, our whole engagement here, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. So I think we, you know, we looked at the 10 commandments, this go around. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the initial kind of engagement was to be about the Beatitudes, right? Mm -hmm. But I think we, we had to did, preface that. <laughs> yeah, we had to preface it with, uh, with what we did here. And I think I'm going to be excited and if you want, read through uh, St. Augustine, because I'm, I'm reading through it now. Maybe we can. Yeah, I'll read through it, too. So I'll have it prepared. Yeah, we can revisit it and see, uh, you know, we, we talked about building the kingdom, uh, you know, here on earth. Um, let's be a little, uh, you know, have some humi humility, right? And talk about building the kingdom of heaven. Not that we know how to do it, but just yeah. through our interpretation and, and expression um, of love, man. For those who don't have the set, the shaft set, you can... Um... There's a PDF, so I can send you a PDF of this exact translation that if people can look into. Yeah, and I'll uh, put it on. Follow uh, along. Yeah, I'll put it on the uh, the description of the video too as yeah. well. So, yeah, I literally had got to uh, run. Um, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, take off, man. Uh, but thank you, appreciate it. Cool. Thank uh, you. With, you know, with no time, you know, we ju you just kind of uh, met with me here, and I'm very grateful for that. So, um, I'll post this probably later today or tomorrow. Uh, and cool. God bless. We'll talk soon. Me too. Thank you. Thanks, man.